On today's video, I'm really excited to show you how I've built this animated paging indicator. We're gonna go step by step here, so make sure you leave enough time and grab a coffee. That's coming up in this video. Hey everybody, this is Alex from nativescripting.com where we have native script advanced and intermediate courses for you so you can take your native script skills up a notch. And if you're here and you want to learn more about native script by watching these tips, tricks, and tutorials, make sure you tap on that subscribe button and hit the little bell so you don't miss any of those. I got a lot of native script tutorials coming up and view, angular, core, animation, lots of animation tutorials because you apparently like those. Oh, and stay to the end of the video for a chance to win a prize. I'll also announce the last prize winner. All right, so I've got a really cool animation tutorial for you today. We're going to be using the animation helpers that I've built with you right here on this channel a few weeks ago check out that video it's called native script animation of any view property i'll link to it down below and there's a card up there and you can animate any property even if they're not available for animating using the native script apis or css an example of this is heights and widths now in native script 6 that's coming out pretty soon we're going to be able to animate heights and widths also but first of all that's not here yet and second of all the way the heights and widths are animated is not quite as smooth as I prefer it to be. I actually created a comparison video of my JavaScript animation function and the heights and widths that are going to be available with the NativeScript API. I'll link to it down below also. You can check it out here as well. Now that might be changed in the near future in the NativeScript API, so keep an eye out for that and keep testing it. I'll also keep you updated here as well on the progress of that. But for now, we're going to be using JavaScript animations, which is going to give you a lot more power anyway, because you can animate any property, not just heights and widths. Without further ado, let's get into it. I'm going to start off with almost from scratch. I've created a new native script core TypeScript project and cleaned out a lot of this stuff in here that was generated by the template. Here's my main page. Here's the XML and here's the CSS. I also removed that view model that came with it. So the first thing I want to do is create a structure and have some kind of way to switch between pages. I'm going to create a grid layout here. And at the top, I'm going to use a flexbox layout. It's going to host a few buttons that are going to be switching between my pages. It really doesn't matter what your technique is for paging or switching between pages. I'm just going to use buttons in this example because this is not what the tutorial is about. It's about creating an animated paging indicator. We're going to generate buttons on the fly because you can have two buttons, you can have three or five or ten. So I'm going to need to add an ID to the Flexbox layout so I can dynamically populate it with buttons. I'm going to give this one the ID button container and I'm going to add the justify content attribute here to space around. All right, and we're not actually putting anything inside the Flexbox layout, so I'm going to leave it on one line. Okay, then we're going to have our dot indicator, the animated indicator, and I'm going to put that inside an absolute layout. So I'm going to create the absolute layout, and I'll just give us an ID for now of dot container, but I'm going to leave it alone for now. And at the bottom, I just want to display what page we're on. So I'm going to give it a label with the text. And I'm going to bind the text to current page. So I'm going to create a little mini view model just to keep track of the current page. And that's what I'm going to bind to here. Let's give it a class. And this is going to be LBL current. And let's give it the property text alignment. I'm going to do center here. I'm also going to do a vertical alignment middle in this absolute layout with the dots. All right, so now we need to space these out in the grid layout. We need to add some rows here. And uh, let's just say the top row with the button is going to have 40 units, then 200 for the container that is going to have the dots, and then auto for the rest of it. Flexbox layout can be in the first row. Absolute layout can be in the second row, which is row one. And this label can be in row two. So that's pretty much it for the markup. Now our page already has a navigating to event here that we're handling in the main page code behind. This is where we're going to hook a few things up. So let's go back here. First, we're going to need that view model that I was talking about. So I'm going to create a view model right in line here. I'm going to use from object. By the way, if you don't know how to use the from object to create a view model, take a look at the video that I'm going to link to down in the description and up above in the cards where I show you how to create a view model from object. So this is just going to have one property on it, current page. We're going to keep track of that. And the reason we're going to use a view model here is going to be evident a little bit later when we're responding to the changes in the current page. All right, so now the navigating to function. 
we got a hold of our page and now we need to get a hold of all our containers so let's create a constant here called button container and we're gonna get a hold of it through the page through the get view by id function remember we gave our button container id of button container just so that it's easy and i don't have to flip back and forth now the button container we defined as a flexbox layout so i'm gonna go ahead and cast it as such there it is i can just select it here in visual studio code and it's going to be auto imported for me right there now i need to just create a few buttons so how many pages are we going to have oh i don't know let's create some constants up here at the top one constant is going to be the number of pages so num pages let's start with four and we also are going to need the dot size later so i'm going to just create that right now dot size let's make it 10. Let's also create the duration for the animation. So I'm going to create that as a constant so we can just reuse it everywhere else. I'm going to call it anim duration and let's make it one second. So down here, when we get a hold of our button container, I'm going to create a for loop to create our actual buttons. So let's start with var i equals zero. i is less than the num pages. And here I'm going to use the button container and it's add child method to add a few buttons to it. I'll just create a separate function called create page button and I'll pass in the index. So down here, I'm going to create a function called create page button. It's going to need the number of the page. So I'm going to pass that in. That's going to be the index and we're, we're going to return a button. Now button for some reason never gets auto imported. I don't know why that is, but I'm going to import it manually. So there's button and that's coming from TNS core modules UI button there it is all right so we need to create a button I'm going to create a constant called button here it's going to be a new button let's give it some text so I'm going to call this page space plus page and of course this button is going to need to be tapped when we tap the button we're going to need to set the current page in our VM so let's add a button tap handler here and we do that by using the on function so on tap, we're going to execute this callback. And this is going to use that VM variable that we've set up. And it's going to set the current page property. And we're going to pass in that page. All right. And once we're done with that, setting up the button, I'm just going to return the button. So this will create the button. It'll add the tab handler to it. And it's going to do it num page times. And it's going to populate that button container. It looks like when I run this code, we're getting a little bit of an error. It says XML parsing error. So let me go and check that out. Okay, so it looks like this label is not terminated. It's not self-closed. So I need to do that. Once I do that, it looks like we're not getting the error anymore. And there we go. So now we have our pagers at the top. I can tap on these and our page gets updated. We don't see that yet. But let's say we have oh, uh, five pages instead of four. So I'm going to make this a five. It's going to restart. And there we go. Page zero through four. All right, I'm going to switch this back to four. And we need a way to indicate what page we're on. And that's this label down here. Why is this label not displaying the current page? Because we actually didn't do any data binding yet. So in our navigating to function, we have the page, but we didn't set its binding context. Let's set its binding context to be VM. That's that view model with the current page. And in order for us to be able to actually see that page in large font, we need to add some styles. So I have this class label current on that label. Let's go to our app.css. I'm going to remove that import. And I'm going to paste in a few styles in here that we're going to need. So there's label current where we're going to set the font size to 100. And these other labels we're going to use a little bit later. These are going to be for the dots. I also probably need to spell text alignment properly. So our label sits in the middle. All right, let's check this out. Oh, there is that big fat zero. When I go to page one, it changes to one, page two, three, zero. Okay, so our pages and this page indicator are actually working fine. Let's get to the meat of the subject here, and that's animation. First, we need to generate some dots. So we're going to get a hold of our dot container, similar to the way we did here with our button container. I'm going to create a constant called dot container. And we're going to use page get view by ID. That's going to be dot container in there as well, because that's the ID of the container. And this is actually an absolute layout. So I'm going to import absolute layout. Looks like Visual Studio Code has given up on my auto imports here. So I'm going to just do this manually. Absolute layout is coming from TNS core modules, UI layouts, and then absolute layout. There it is. So now we got the dot container. 
Now we're going to need to do some calculations of where we're going to place this container. We'll do this in a little bit. For now, let's go ahead and add a number of dots based on the number of pages. So I'm just going to copy this for loop right here and paste it right there. We're going to loop through the number of pages again, and we're going to use the dot container this time and add children to it. But instead of creating the page button, we're going to create page dot. So we need to create a new function called create page dot. All right, let's go down here. Function create page dot. This is also going to take in the number of the page and it's going to return a label. Now I'm using a label here because a label can just be molded into any shape. And since we need the indicators, they can just be circles, which uh, can just be a styled label. Now, if you want to learn about how to create shapes properly in NativeScript using inheritance from the main root view class, I have a video for that. I'll link to it down below as well. Let's import label that's coming from TNS core modules UI label. All right, let's go back down here and we're going to create a new label constant label equals new label. Let's give it a class name. So we're creating the number of labels right now as there are pages. That means that these are going to be the gray labels in the background. So I'm going to give it the class label gray. And that's this one right here where the background color is this dark gray. You can give it whatever color you want, of course. So let's give this label a width and the width is going to be the dot size. Remember that constant we've set up at the top. All right. We also need to give it a height, which is going to be the dot size as well. So right now this label is going to be a little square, but we can give it a border radius. And if we define that to be dot size divided by two, then it's going to be a circle instead of a square. We also don't want these labels to be on top of each other. Right now, if I have four labels created, these are the dots. If I have four dots created, they're all created on top of each other and we'll only see one. In order to move them around, we're going to need to set the left property on each one differently. So I'm going to set left based on the dot size multiplied by two. So the space between the labels is going to be the same width as the label itself. And then I'm going to multiply this by page. So we want to space them out differently. All right. And then I'm going to just return this label. So now you can see there it is. There are the four little dots. If I go up here and I change the dot size to say 40, then the dots are going to be bigger and they're going to be further spaced apart. So you can make them whatever size you want. I'm going to keep them as 10. Okay. So there are the dots, but I don't like the positioning. I want to kind of position them in the middle of the screen. So we need to do a little bit of calculation here. We need to get the width of the screen. And in order to do that, we're going to need to use the platform module. So width is going to use platform. Let's see if that's going to import automatically. Not sure why that's not working. All right, but let's go up here and say import star as platform from TNS core modules platform. All right, now let's head back down. We want to get platform dot screen and then we want to get the main screen and we want to get the width in dips. So this will give us the total width of the screen but we want to place the dot container in the middle based on the number of pages that we have. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a calculation. So we want to get the left position of that container, and that's going to be based on the dot size multiplied by two times the number of pages minus one dot size, because we want to take that off the end there. Now we want to just take the width and subtract that whole length of the dots that we're going to have. And this is going to give us that space, the total space around that container based on the width. So we want to just divide that by two to get the left value. So now all we need to do is just say dot container margin left and set that to left. All right. And there it is. It's down in the center. Now, if I have a different number of dots, let's say I have 10 pages, you can see that we have a little bit of a problem with the page buttons at the top, but our dots are actually positioned right in the middle, which is pretty nice. All right. So let's get that back to four and let's go back down here and continue. What's missing? Well, we have a missing dot and that's the dot that's going to be indicating the current page. So we need to create another dot that's going to be the current page. So let's get a hold of the current page and that's going to be coming from the VM. We're going to get the current page 
as a number. And then we're gonna use that same technique we used before where we're gonna add a child to the dot container and we're gonna use our create page dot function. But here we're gonna send in the current page as the number. But how do we differentiate this from the other dots that we've created, the gray dots? Well, we need to somehow let this function know that we wanna create a different color dot. In our case, it's gonna be a black dot. So I'm just gonna send an optional parameter of true here. And I'm gonna add an optional parameter of selected as a Boolean here, all right? So all our dots are going to be gray. However, if selected is passed in and it's true, then I'm going to set another class to this label. I'm going to give it the class label black. So now this dot is going to be black instead. All right. So now you can see that page zero is the one that's selected and we have a black dot on top of the gray dot in that first position. If I switch pages here, nothing's going to happen because we're not actually listening for any changes. We can listen for the changes and I have a video here on how to do that as well. It's called reacting to property changes in native script. You can check that out. There's a link in the description. So VM on, it has a special property change event that could happen. This is an event that actually comes with native script. You don't need to specifically define this as a custom event. And the argument type is going to be property change data that gets auto imported. Great. When any property on our view model changes, this handler will be triggered. But our view model could have many different properties. What we want to really check for is the property name. And we want to make sure that the property name actually matches this property in the view model, which is current page. So only then we're going to execute the following code. So it's in this function here that we're going to actually respond to the changes in the current page and perform our animation. First, we need to get a hold of the old page, which is going to be arg.old value, and we want to cast that to a number. And then we want to get a hold of the new page. And that's going to be arg.value. Let's cast that as a number as well. And also, we want to support jumping between pages. So our paging indicator is going to be able to jump from page 0 to page 3, for example, and so on. So we need to be able to know how far we've jumped. And that's going to be a page diff. And we can also jump back and forth from a page that's a higher number, like page 3, back to page 0. So that's why we're going to use the absolute value here. I'm going to use absolute value and new page minus old page. That's going to be our page diff. Since we're animating that one dot that we've created, that's the indicator of the current page, I want to be able to get a hold of it in this property change event handler. So I want to actually have it out here. I'm going to create a variable to store it. I'm going to call it label selected and it's going to be of type label and it's going to be initially null but when we create that label down here that dot i want to go ahead and set it so label selected is going to be our label now we have a hold of it okay so now we can manipulate it all all we want inside this property change event handler now for the animation, if you haven't seen my JavaScript animation in NativeScript tutorial, make sure you watch that if you want to know how these functions are created. But I'm going to create an animation helper here, animation helpers.ts file, which is going to contain all my animation helper functions. I'm going to paste them in here. But if you want to know step by step on how these are created, check out that tutorial that I've created here. I'll link to it down below as well. It's actually called native script animation of any view property video. This is what we're going to be using to animate our dots. So here's where we are so far. If we navigate between pages, there's no animation taking place. And that's what we're going to fix now. Each time that we animate our dot, it does two steps. The first step is it stretches out. So one of its edges actually stays in place while the edge that's closer to the target dot to the target page dot is going to be stretched out until it reaches the target dot. And then the second stage of the animation is going to be the back end catching up. So we're going to have to split this up into a two stage animation process. So we're going to call animate here. Let's make sure that we've imported the correct animate that's coming from animation helpers. Yes. All right. So animate, this is going to take in a duration and a set of animation definitions, and it's going to return a promise. So first is a duration. We already have an animation duration, but since the first part of the animation is going to be taken up half the time, I'm going to divide the duration by two. And then we need to pass in the animation definitions as an array. 
array. So the first part of the animation is to stretch out the width of our selected label. So I'm going to create an object here. This is going to be the definition. And you can see a few properties here. I'm not going to explain most of these as these are explained in detail in that animation video that I've created the tutorial. Let's go ahead and set a condition here. And I'll explain what the condition is because we didn't have that in the previous video. The condition basically lets the animation move forward. So it's a function that returns whether the animation should actually execute or not. So in this case, I do want it to execute. So I'm going to just return true. And we're going to need this a little bit later. You'll see why we might not want to return true from the condition. Then we need to return curve. And for now, I'm just going to have this linear, but we're going to change this. And I explained curve in the animation video. Curve is just a mapping function that's going to basically give us the animation timing function. Next is get range. So this will provide a function that's going to return what the initial value is and what the final value is. So it's coming from some initial value and it's going to some other value. So the from value is just going to be dot size. Since we're animating the width, it's starting out at dot size and it's going to a different size. What size is it going to? Well, we can calculate it. It's going to be dot size times two times page diff plus dot size. Because this is an object, we actually need to create a function here with a body and return that object. Otherwise, we have a syntax error. And finally, we need a step function here. This is also another one that I explain in the animation tutorial. And this is going to get the updated value for each step of the animation for each frame. So we're going to use that label selected and we're going to set its width to the value that's coming in. This is the first half of the animation. If we take a look now, and I'm going to tap on page one, you'll see the animation happen, the first half of the animation. So the width increases from the initial dot size to cover that second dot. And that's this get range calculation. This is that two value that we've calculated. All right. Now, what about catching up with the tail? Well, the tail of the dot also has to be animated. And we have a way that we can trigger an animation after the first one completes. Because the first one returns a promise, we can use the then handler here. And that's what, exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to call the animate function again. And this time we're going to use animation duration divided by two again. The second parameter is an array that's going to take in animation definitions. And that has a condition, which is also going to be just returning true. Let's set the curve to be a basic linear curve. We're going to change the curve a little bit later just to make it more snappy. But for now, I'm just going to set it to linear. Get range is an important one here not to get wrong. So this is going to return an object and that object is going to have a from property from is going to be the current label selected dot width. Let's set it as number and two is just going to be back to dot size because we want to return it back to the original size in a new place. And let's go to step. Step is going to take in a value and we're still working with the width. So we're going to say label selected dot width. It's going to be set to V. All right. So this should actually animate forward and then backward after that. And there we go. Now, how do we keep that dot from going back to its original position and actually animating to the new spot? Well, we need to animate another property of that label, and that's the left property. So we need a starting point. Let's get the initial left value of that label. So that's label selected dot left as number. And we need to animate the left side right now, because we're moving from, let's say, page zero to page one, we need to animate the left property on the second half of our animation. So that's going to be over here. So I'm going to create another animation definition here. Let's set the condition to true for now, but it's not going to be for long. And I'll show you why in a minute. The curve is going to be linear again. Get range is going to return an object and we're going from label selected left as number and we're going to dot size times two times new page. So that's going to be the new left location. We want to make sure that we position it where that second pages dot is located. And for each step, this function is going to be a little different than before. Here, we're actually going to be animating and moving the left value of the label selected. I'm going to hit page one here, and you'll see that our dot moves from the first position to the second position. I'm going to hit page two, and the same thing happens. Page three, and that works. But what happens if I go backwards? What if I go back to page one? Well, that's a problem, isn't it? It's not the right kind of animation that we expect to happen. It actually jumps forward and then backwards. Let's see, does my long jump work? Yes, it does. So that's good. But jumping backwards or moving backwards doesn't work. Why is that? Because we're animating the left 
all the time in every single case. And that's not what we need to do. So for the first half of the animation, we also need to animate the left property. So I'm going to create an animation definition here that's going to animate the left property. But we need to make sure that we're actually moving backwards based on a certain condition that the new page is less than the old page. So here we are going to need the condition and we're going to set new page is less than old page. And only in this case, we're going to be animating backwards with the left property. So let's set our curve and the get range is going to be another function here. We're going to return from label left. That's the property that we set over here. And we're going to go to dot size times two times new page. And we need that step function also. So it's going to be a value and we need to set the label selected left property to V. Now, since we are checking this condition for the label left property when we're moving backwards, we also need to conditionally change the left property when we're moving forward. So this would just be the opposite condition. It'll be when new page is bigger than old page. We don't want the second step out of the animation happening if it's going in reverse. Let's save that and take a look. I'm going to skip to page two and then go back to page one. And now it animates properly. So now we have our animation working just fine. Let's do a couple of changes here just to make sure everything is good. I'm going to change the dot size to 40 and see what happens here. This will make more obvious that our animation is actually not very spiffy because this is a linear animation, so it's not very good looking. Now, what I like to do is actually use a package called D3 ease to make that animation a lot better looking. I'm going to hit control tilde to open up my terminal and I'm going to install from NPM the D3 ease package. So NPM install D3 ease dash dash save. And I'm also going to install the typings for it. So NPM install at types slash D3 dash ease. And that's going to be a dev dependency. So save dev. All right, let's close this out and check our package.json file. There's D3 ease and there's the types for it. Great. So now that we have that in there, this is going to make our animation a lot better looking. I'm going to import star as D3 from D3 ease. And let's head back down here to our animation functions. And specifically, I want to focus on these curves. When we're animating the left property, I want to use D3 ease exponential in. So I want it to exponentially increase with speed. And I want to do the same thing for our width as well. So I'm going to change this curve property too. Now, when we're moving on the second half of the animation, I want to do something a little bit different. Here, I want to say D3 ease exponential out because at this point, we're slowing down. This is the second half of the animation. So I want to use D3x out here. Okay. Now, Let's go back to our app and I'm going to tap on page three and you can see that the speed up happens. You can even notice it. It starts out really slowly and then it speeds up and then it kind of snaps into place, which is really nice. So let's change this back to, I don't know, size 20 and maybe add five pages and see what that looks like. And there's five pages and the dots are a little bit smaller and we can still use it the same way we did before, where we can skip around on the pages and everything is animated and it looks nice. There's going to be a few more of these coming up in the next few weeks. You're going to really love these animation tutorials we got coming up here. So consider subscribing if you haven't already. Just hit that subscribe button and click the little bell so you don't miss any of those notifications. I'm going to start a new segment here where I'm going to read some of your comments right here. We're going to get to that shortly. But first, one order of business. I promised you that I'm going to announce a giveaway and we're going to run a new contest for the next giveaway. So I'm giving away a iScript native t-shirt. That's a t-shirt with that logo right there. I no, I'm not wearing it today. I probably should be. Actually, I have it right here. This is mine, by the way. You're going to get a brand new one. This is what you're going to get. And the winner is Muhammad al -Araishi. Congratulations, Muhammad. Thanks for tweeting out iScript Native. I appreciate you commenting on my videos also. And I'll send one of these out to you along with some stickers. Please get in touch with me on Twitter. And uh, if you are on Twitter, I'm at Digitalix over there. So feel free to reach out to me and follow me over there where I tweet random stuff about NativeScript and other tech. 
The next contest is I'm giving away a free course, Securing Native Script Applications. This is a more intermediate to advanced level course where I teach you how to secure your native script applications. We we'll work with client server security here. I show you how to do basic login and registration, SSL pinning, JWT, external authentication and authorization providers, using Auth0, how to protect your client data. We're using serverless proxies, token storage, code protection via obfuscation and different obfuscation options and other security considerations. So there's a lot of stuff packed into this over four hour course and I'm going to give it away for free. I'm going to select one person. All you got to do is tweet or post on Facebook something about native scripting or share this video and make sure you put the hashtag iScriptNative on there so that I know how to find you. I'll announce the winner of that shortly in one of the next upcoming videos. So make sure you subscribe also so you know if you've won or not. So now it's time to read some of your comments, folks. Let's take a look at the previous video I posted, which is this native script height animation test. This is where I was checking out the new height and width animation APIs that are coming out in native script six. Siska says, great video. Could you show us off native script view repo sharing code with a web view? Well, thanks, Siska. So I take it you want to see uh, code sharing with NativeScript View. I may do a video on that shortly. I'm not sure when that's coming yet, though. I'm actually waiting for NativeScript View to have TypeScript support. Hopefully that's going to be coming out soon because that's going to make code sharing a lot easier. Euvoria says, I use Parallax plugin. How to make sticky element without plugin. I really need to see what you mean by that. Uh, an example of that would be good. Give me a URL or something so I know what you're talking about. And perhaps I'll create a video about that. Thanks for that. Richard Vink with the, the fire breathing unicorn avatar. Pretty cool. One like from me may not look like much, but you'll always get that for every single video. Thank you so much for doing this. Richard, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Thank you very much. And Cyanjin85 says, first. Really? You're first? I thought I had the first comment. I don't know about that. Maybe you are first. And they say, yes, this behavior does look a little awkward, to be honest. I hope the dev team will add to that config option. That's the config option I mentioned in the video. Anyway, it's cool they're looking into these improvements. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. We've been waiting for this for many years. So now it's actually coming. And then Bioprogramming says, no, I don't use animations too much. Not a fan of animations. Okay, it's not for everybody. You don't need to have animations in every single application. Animations do add a little bit of polish to your application if they're not overused. Sometimes we see animations that are really poorly done in applications where they're overused, they take too long. I created a whole course on native script animations. It's up on Pluralsight. If anybody has a Pluralsight subscription, you can check that out. It's still valid, but I also share a lot of more updated techniques here on this channel. So thanks to everybody who commented and I will see you all in the next tutorial. Bye.